today I'm talking to customers who say, you know, we have weekly releases and it's not good enough. We need to be agile. Welcome to Architecture Corner. Today our guest as usual are Gregor and Joachim. And today's topic is about extreme contracts. When I'm training my dog, it's very important to give some reward immediately if after he has done something good. And I think this is one of the benefits with extreme contracts. Uh, I think you really need to understand that the, the contracts you're you are assigning to a software development project will create behaviors on the supplier side and the buyer side. That is something you need to be aware of. First of all, I think that uh... If you're watching this and you've never heard of extreme contracts, uh, I made a video a few weeks ago with uh, Jakob Rome. Go and, and view a bit of that and, and check out his blog post uh, so you have a bit of background. But let me say, you know, what is an extreme contract? An extreme contract is a contract that is focused on getting started to work and getting started uh, to deliver and, and not committing uh, so much that you're afraid of getting started. No, and, and by doing that, I suppose the, the one of the major uh, benefits would be that the, the, the time until you get some kind of benefit back would be very, very short. Uh, and as, a, as an organization, if, if time to market and the, and the speed to, to deploy new functionality is important, and I would say it, it is for most every single, uh, every single company I'm working with, the, the time to market is very, very important. So therefore, it should be something that, that they should look into. Mm. So... Uh... It used to be that companies had quarterly releases of software, uh, at, and that was great. Today, I'm talking to customers who say, you know, we have weekly releases, and it's not good enough. We need to be agile. We need to do DevOps, and uh, well, we had another episode about mm -hmm. that. But uh, in this context, uh, in uh, in the extreme contract uh, concept, is um, as uh, Jacopo has implemented it, is that you you do a one week. Uh, iteration. At the end of the iteration, you say to the customer, look what we've built for you in one week. Do you want this? And if the customer wants it, they pay for it and they get it. If they don't want it, they don't pay and you know you end the relationship. So there is no actual commitment except the time of each party. Yeah, and, and one week investment, so to say, from the, from the, the both parties. And I think th this way, that going back to, to the behavior, it means that as a supplier, you really need to make sure that you're making the high client happy. You are delivering value, you are actually doing something that they, they can use within a week. If you don't do that, you're risking your, your situation, you're risking your contract. If you do it too bad, you're out. So it's a way of making sure that, that the supplier and also the client have a, a common goal of actually delivering value. And it's value focused, I think that that's the real, real point of this, that you are ensuring short time value. Mm, absolutely. And, and, and that works in certain contexts. When you're building a, a web service, for instance, I mean, a web based service, an application, an app, you can easily see, OK, we've added this functionality now. We've added, added this functionality now. We've made this a little bit better. And uh, if you're doing A-B testing and so on, you can easily even see the value of it. Hmm. And in and, and that way, uh, an extreme contract would work really well. Yeah, and also thinking about uh, companies like, like Google, for instance, when, when you use the Google X or, or whichever functionality, they don't do this, uh, our, this uh, quarterly releases. They do some kind of releases which are more or less invisible to, to the end user. And I think this is the same kind of, of um, behavior, the same, same kind of situation that you can easily just deploy a new button or a new something without doing a major release that is most likely no need for any training for the, for the, for the end users. They, you could be able to actually implement this new functionality very smoothly and very gradually into the system. I think that that's part of, also part of the beauty. So, I, you know, I guess that in, in some uh, situations there will be problems. Maybe uh, you weren't able to produce value and, or, or maybe what you thought was the value was not what a customer thought was the value. And there are two ways out there. Uh, one way is that you know you say, okay, sorry, we had one bad week, let's quit this relationship. And the other is to say, 
Well, we do twice as good next week because now we, we know something more. We have learned something about each other and, and we'll do the next week much better. Mm. Yeah, and, it, and I think one thing when you talk about this kind of contract, it's very easy to come down to a situation where you talk about technology, where you use technology in this or that way. But I think in what you're saying right now is, is the, the way that the actors are collaborating, the way they are understanding each other, the way they are exchanging information, that's actually a core piece of this kind of puzzle. You need, really need to have a collaboration which works down to the lowest level detail. It's not technology, it's about people to people collaborating. Absolutely. There was a, um, a research report recently uh, by, by some of my friends at, at Lund University where, where they came to this conclusion that you know tools and processes are, are good for, for requirements engineering, verification, validation, because that's what it's about. You know, mm -hmm. What requirement is what you want, and yeah. verification is do I deliver what you want. Yeah. And tools and so on are nice, but it's really the relationship it comes down to. Yeah, I think the, the risk otherwise, if you, if you have very strong focus on, on process, very strong focus on, on tools, it's that you will deliver something very exactly wrong. You're very exact and precise in the delivery, but you might end up with something utterly wrong. I see the same kind of thinking in the AM, application maintenance area. We have a situation that, that the IT business for the last uh, two or three decades or so on, they have been going into a mode where they are delivering an AM contract that has a construct making, making sure that innovation cannot happen. Because the way the contracts are assigned, the, the, if the, the vendor, if the supplier would be innovative, they would lose money. Joachim, did you read my blog post on uh, technical debt that uh, was oh. published two weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. So what often, often happens is that you start with a very nice application with, you know, kind of 100% quality. And, and, and then uh, as time goes by, uh, you add functionality, but you also add bugs and you add bugs and, and you need to handle those. And it becomes really expensive. Sometimes you could use 80%, 90% of your your total IT spend is just on, on handling those bad things that you're not really interested in. Mm -hmm. And then you go and say, Ooh, what if someone could help me with this really cheap? What if, what if someone could, could put some, some, some sheep working on this for, for you know, just in, in exchange of grass? And, and wouldn't that really solve my problem? Because then I could cut down on that cost. Mm -hmm. But there is the other option. And the other option is that, you know, this system isn't very good anymore. Uh, maybe I should get rid of it. Maybe I should... Uh, get better quality mm -hmm. uh, and so if going back so cutting your costs uh, by doing it cheaper is one way but cutting your cost by doing it better is maybe a better way yeah it, uh, absolutely um, I was seen a couple of situations with, with major financial com companies where, where I did a tech, tech depth study and actually realizing that the technical depth of this uh, system was far bigger than the total cost they have spent for it and that of course is a, is a thing that don't keep the system. This has, this has by far overblown the depth of, of the system. So there are situations where you really need to understand the technical depth and understand what are my options. The problem is that most organizations, they don't know the, the, or understand the, the actual technical depth and if they do, they don't know how to react on it. So, and then the, the very simple reaction is, well, keep it, just go on. But you need to have some kind of intelligence, some kind of information in order to make smart decisions. And most organizations are lacking that, I think. There uh, was a survey a few go uh, years ago uh, done with major uh, European companies, their CFOs, and they, they asked, uh, are your uh, bespoke software systems uh, correctly evaluated? And 80% said, no, most of our systems are overvalued because they're valued at, at, at what we paid for them, mm -hmm. and then with, with some write-off. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, often doing your own system it's a very expensive way to get uh, to buy yourself a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. But also think about the value of the system. Say if you contracted a system 20 years ago, most likely you did that because there were no standard system in place at that time, so you had to do it. But down the line, 10 years later, 15 years later, there most likely will be a standard system that is doing exactly the same thing and in a better way at a lower cost. Uh, so in that point, you what you actually did buy was a, a head time. You, did, you bought 10 years ahead of the competition. That's what you actually bought for. But most people don't view that. They view that they bought a system and the system has a value by itself. And I don't think that's right. You really need to understand when in time is the, is the cost and when in time do you see the value. Yeah, you can't rest on your laurels. No. Just because you were le uh, leading in, in your business uh, uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, doesn't mean you are now. 
No. I, I, I'm something to talk with, with clients about uh, gravity and uh, innovation gravity. What's top of the line right now? It will fall down. It will just by itself fall down and become non-innovation. Very soon it will become non-innovation. So in order to do that, there are two things which are important. One thing is of course to keep investing in innovation that you all the time can add new functionality, new areas and so on. But also to take out what was cutting edge, what was the bleeding edge, the, the top line innovation five years ago is not anymore and you need to stop treating it as innovation. It's some, suddenly it becomes commodity and it needs a totally different mindset when, when handling it. I, I have a theory and it, it is that the, the bigger the step you have taken to reach your current position, the, the bigger risk you've taken, the, the more insecure you will feel about your position and, and the harder it, it will be for you to leave it. So, so by doing mega projects, you're putting yourself in a position mm. where, where you will be more ossified in the future. Yeah, yeah. But if you take small steps, taking an, another small step and another small step isn't really that scary. No, and I think it basically goes back to both organization level, but most likely personal level, that you have invested this much time into this and you put pride into this and therefore you will protect it for a long time. It's about people, it's about organizations, yeah. it's about, you know, we have a huge investment, it, it's, it's not written off yet. No, it's a sunk cost in reality, yeah. So if I compare this back to uh, my dog analogy and to train in a new way, that was very hard for those that has been training a long time ago in the old fashioned way and to start training with rewards that was completely utterly new and then didn't know how to do it and it took them 10 to 15 years to learn the new things. Is it the same, do you think, with IT and changes in companies? I think in a way it's the same, but uh, that there is one thing which is really not worth this analogy. And, and the point is that this kind of development, I would say that the, there is this, this clash thing that the, the only concept is change. And it, that's really true. We are working with something which is constantly changing. And that, that is really something you need to take to your heart and understand that there is no stability. You need really are always working with change. Thank you very much for discussing extreme contracts and the implications for the organizations and the benefits you will get by improving the change rate. Thank you very much and welcome back next time. Thank you. Thank you.